Hello and welcome to Off the Fence, a podcast where we deconstruct difficult decision making so that we can find out what keeps us stuck and more importantly, how do we get unstuck? I'm your host, Karen Covey, a former divorce lawyer, mediator, and arbitrator turned coach, author, and entrepreneur. With me today is my guest, Sylvia Nazar. And Sylvia is a CPA, a CDFA, and a partner with Friedman Huey and Associates. She works with individuals, families, and businesses to deliver customized tax and wealth planning solutions. She provides her clients with insights and integrity for their accounting matters and focuses on forming lasting relationships with her clients. She collaborates with financial advisors, attorneys, and insurance agents to help her clients achieve their business and personal goals and get the best solutions for them. Sylvia believes that team, the teamwork that she uses is critical in providing her clients with the peace of mind they deserve. Sylvia, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Karen, for such a wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to be here and looking forward to our conversation. So am I. Um, and I want to dive in with like starting with the very, very basics, right? People have heard the term CPA. They they kind of sort of know what a CPA is. But if you could start by explaining what is the difference between a CPA and a regular accountant and what do you do differently? Sure. Uh, so CPA stands for Certified uh, Public Accountant. And as a lawyer, you have to pass a test. Uh, to get that certification. So obviously there is a little bit more of uh, technical skills and knowledge that you have to pass to get that certification. Um, and there are a lot of CPAs uh, who um, you know, prefer the tax returns, different tax returns. There are also a lot of accountants who could be uh, just um, finishing accounting school and not going for the CPA license. They still are knowledgeable, but they cannot represent you in front of the IRS. Um, so I would think that the difference between regular accountant who is not a CPA, they still have the knowledge, but sometimes uh, higher technical um, issues that uh, they need to address, they might reach out to someone who is a CPA licensed person. Got it. So as you know, this podcast focuses a lot on decision making. Why did you decide to go for your CPA? If you can do most things as a regular accountant, why bother yourself with going through the big test and going the extra mile? Um, the regular account, uh, accountant, a lot of times they enter the numbers into the tax software and to generate the tax return. And if you have a very basic tax situation, this is all what you need. You don't need to have anyone who is highly qualified to do that. Going into the business, I really like consulting and advisory side of it. So I knew that I need to have specific technical skills to help in a little bit more complex situations, not only providing a tax return as a pro end product, everyone needs a tax return, but a lot of times in, um, in my um, uh, area, I provide consulting and advisory if someone is going through the divorce, if they're selling the business, or maybe they inherited uh, um, some wealth and they really are not familiar with all the things they need to do. So, I decided to go for that CPA licensing certification just to make sure that I have all the skills and all the knowledge that I need to to better serve my clients. That makes so much sense. And I, I happen to know from us having conversations in the past that you do a lot of complicated stuff, right? And you guide your clients to make, I assume, tax decisions. Can you tell me a little bit more about what kinds of decisions that you guide your clients to make? What situations might they be faced with where they'd need a CPA? Right. There could be, uh, there are so many options. And a lot of people, when they look at their tax return, they don't realize how much complexity could be there uh, if you have something going on. So if you, uh, let's say, inherit a wealth from your parents, there needs to be some estate planning. There needs to be some trust that maybe you need to take things out of your estate so your estate is not taxable or there is no uh, estate tax. If you go through the divorce, you look at all the assets, there needs to be division of assets and you have to start filing the return and conserve the wealth uh, in a sense. Um, a lot of clients come to us too when uh, they want to make sure that they, are, um, they have uh, very complex investments 
with foreign disclosure, with multi-state disclosures, and they want to make sure that they're filing everywhere when they need to, so they're penalty protected, but also they're not going to have any issues with the IRS. So there are multiple situations. Every situation is very different. I work with a lot of multi-generational families when you have grandparents, parents, and the children, and each of uh, those generations have different financial and tax needs. Um, so making sure that we have open discussions about their financial goals, what they want to do, and just working with other professionals as the one team uh, to achieve the client's goal. You know, I'm I'm glad you said that because you mentioned, you know, I saw in your uh, bio that teamwork is something that you really value. What, how does a CPA fit into a person's financial team? Mm -hmm. So if uh, someone has specific financial goals because they have wealth, they want to preserve it, or they want to make sure that it's there when they need it, when they retire, it's not only about the tax planning. You have to have specific investments. So you have to have a, a financial advisor on your team when, um, if there is an opportunity to invest, they have someone who is going to analyze the tax consequences of that investment. Then if you have a complex situation, you have to have a family attorney to make sure that uh, everything is legally properly uh, structured and then you have legal documents to protect your investment. Uh, so I work with the attorneys. Uh, if um, we need someone uh, because they have art collection or jewelry connection, I would work with the insurance agents. So in the sense, when the client hires me at that a bit complex level, I am a quarterback of everyone who needs to be part of their um, financial and wealth uh, situation. And we talk to each other all the time. And I always say, I don't work for Freeman and Huey anymore. I work for Mr. Smith uh, because I'm part of his team that is collectively made of other professionals. That is so important and so wonderful that you do that um, for people. I'd like to steer the conversation a little bit into the area specifically of divorce. Now, you and I both know there are a lot of tax consequences that people need to be aware of when they're going through a divorce. Can you just list some of the most common ways that taxes affect divorce and what people have to keep in mind when they're going through it? Absolutely. Uh, some of the things that people are going to uh, deal with is, first of all, what really goes on my tax return? How much income I'm reporting? People do have wages and business income, but there are also investment income. There are gains that they have from the investment. And how is it going to be allocated between the spouses? There are retirement accounts that need to be divided as well. And how does it affect your tax uh, return after you get divorced? And then also your cash flow. That's why we need financial advisors, me personally, so they can run the projection of how much cash needs I'm going to have for all the expenses, but also how much taxes I'm going to pay so I can preserve that and save for that. Um, when people get divorced, they don't realize that they look at the main number. So let's say um, you know the, the, the couple has a million dollars. If they're going to split it 500 and 500, let's say 50-50 to simplify it, the tax consequences of those uh, two pools of assets could be totally different because there could be assets that have no tax basis, meaning that if you have a sale, you have to pay gain on the total value of that. And there could be assets that have basis, meaning that portion of uh, the transaction will not be taxable. And you have to be really, really careful. And that's why you have to hire a professional to tell you what will be the tax consequences after this asset allocation. And maybe you prefer a different version, making sure that both uh, sides are going to agree and take responsibility of what's in their wealth, uh, family wealth. You know, I that is, what you've said is so important. And I'm not sure that everybody really gets it, right? Because you just said it so eloquently and that, that people might not realize what the basis is and how getting, let's say there are two different investments um, and they have different tax bases, how that would affect a divorce settlement. If one person says, you get this and I'll keep that, but they have different tax bases or bases, right. um, then how much actually gets into their pocket at the end of the day can be very, very different. And it sounds like 
You're the person who analyzes that and says, no, 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 this one is going to cost you a lot in taxes, this one not so much. Is that what you do? Yes. Uh, So I work with the financial advisor when they provide me the information. So the, the basis, just to make it very simple, is the cost of the investment. So let's say if you bought Apple stock and you paid 20,000 or 2,000 for it, but it's worth much more, your basis is that original investment and you will pay gain on the difference between your cost, original cost and the fair market value at the time of the sale. So if uh, uh, a couple has a million dollars of stocks, if depending on how you're going to allocate them, there could be stocks with the low basis, meaning that the low, there was a long, uh, very low investment, uh, let's say, let's look at the Tesla uh, stack, right? Someone could buy, buy it very, very early and now it's ma- worth much more. $500 of this stack will generate a lot of tax because there is a lot of gain included in that. Your low cost versus the very high fair market value at the time. If the other spouse is going to get a stack that maybe cost it 150 or 200,000, obviously that gain is much smaller and your tax li- liability is much smaller. So it's very important to go through the list of all the assets that uh, each couple has and how it's going to be allocated. So it's fair. If someone is very specific and wants to keep that asset, they need to compensate the other spouse for the possible tax liabilities that are going to be in the future when they when they dispose of the asset. You know, it sounds like your expertise could also come in really handy for people where there is one like wage earner in the family, the spouse who makes a lot of money and the other spouse maybe was the stay-at-home parent or doesn't make so much money. Is it possible then to allocate assets based on tax liability so the person at the lower tax rate actually pays the tax on that asset? Does that make sense? Right. Yes. So, and that's why it's so beautiful to bring different professionals because everyone is going to have a little bit different perspective and, and everyone is going to present some options that the, you have to decide which way you want to go. A lot of times people just want to be done with everything what they do, but they also need to understand what the tax consequences are going to be. A lot of people are very emotional about, about specific assets and they don't want them to be divided or they don't want to let them go you have to make sure that you understand all the financial consequences. If it's a a tax liability, if it's a cash flow issue, a lot of times people love their houses and they want to keep the houses, but right right after the asset division, there might not be enough income or cash flow to keep up with all the expenses. It might not make any sense. The statistics do say that if there is a divorce, woman is usually financially much more worse than men and to understand all the options and then to protect each spouse, we have to be very, very careful how we are dividing it. So what I'm saying is a lot of times in, include all those professionals. So you make educated decisions based on the facts and numbers, uh, and then you will understand everything. It's going to release that fear of running out of money or sticking to something that maybe just not right for you. You know, it- That is so, so important. I'm so glad you brought this up because everybody, when they're facing a divorce, their initial reaction is usually fear. Am I going to run out of money? Do I have enough to do this? And so they look at the idea of putting together a team makes them crazy because they're like, wait, I'm just bleeding money is what they feel like, right? But what I'm hearing you say is that far from it, that when you have that team with the right professionals on it, it actually saves you money in the long run. Is that right? Yes. So for example, the the, uh, the example that you gave when you have a higher earner and lower earner, the higher earner, you see the wages, but there are other ways of compensation. There could be benefits, there could be stock options. If you don't hire the right team, you can leave on the table a lot of uh, wealth that you are not aware of, that's not going to be allocated to you because you just don't know about it. We do have complex situations when there is very super wealthy clients that if they know that they go through divorce, they would like to hide some assets. Uh, if we talk about um, um, uh, cyber assets, something that is not tangible in the sense you don't you you know it's out there, like PFCs and you know Coinbase. Uh, uh, um, the, the uh, currency, current, currency, I was missing that word. 
uh, you you don't you cannot touch it. It's out there. So a lot of times, sometimes you have to uh, hire a forensic accountant to find those assets. Because I am experienced with multiple with different uh, kinds of returns, I know that a lot of times there are trusts that maybe are not generating income, which means you don't see it on the tax return, but there are assets in that trust that are going to be triggered with some kind of event. If you don't know anything about this trust, there could be millions of dollars that the spouse is keeping from themselves and you're really eligible for, for that share. Uh, so that's why hiring specific professionals, it might look like you're spending all the money, but it's really it's worth when you have some kind of wealth and complex situation because you're going to be multiplying that investment into more things that you're going to get after the divorce. 100%. So how, let's say I'm a divorcing client, I come to you, how do I decide whether or not I need a CPA at your level to be part of the team? Or what, like, how do I know whether there's a chance of hidden assets or whether I'm just, you know, angry and upset. And so I'm, I'm thinking there's something there that really the chance is small that it exists. Right. Uh, so when the client comes to me, I, uh, I, I always would like to take a look at the last two years of the tax return. And right now, some people don't even have a physical copy. With everything being electronic, it could be something they save as a PDF, and that person never looked at that uh, tax return. A lot of times, uh, there could be a situation when the return is done, and the one spouse is in charge of all the finances, signs the return, and just hands you a page hey, please sign the return, we need to file it. And you don't even look at that, that form. You don't know what goes there. A lot of times when I ask the clients, like how much tax, tax did, you, did you pay or how much was your adjusted income, total income, I don't know. So I would always start with going through the return and um, uh, selecting or uh, specifying all the assets that generated income and were included on the tax return. But then also you follow up with a lot of questions. Sometimes you either... Um, reach out to their uh, family attorney to see what trusts are there. Are there any uh, entity returns that uh, uh, the couple was filing? So you kind of start with really, really good questions. And because of my like, expertise, I know what kind of questions to ask and I know what could be out there. And when you run into business, uh, how to evaluate the business? What's the value of the business right now and what to do with that? Uh, do we want to stay in the business? Should the business be sold and divided? So you go through all the things that are, are out there and then you, uh, with the other members of the team, like attorneys and financial advisors, you come up with specific options and then I would reevaluate that for tax uh, consequences and point out a few things that maybe um, my client needs to be aware of or know that this is going to generate a little bit more tax, but in the long run, it's better off because of the investments. So there could be multiple situations that we're going to have, but my job is to point out specific things that I'm aware of and based on my experience I've seen before. Uh, understanding the full financial situation of the client, knowing what could be out there. Uh, a little bit understanding of, of the family. So there could be very wealthy grandparents. There could be, uh, you know, parents who maybe uh, pay for uh, specific things. So the, the situation could be really, really complex. And we want to make sure that we're going to look at every single aspect of it. You know, something you keep saying that you, it's important for people to understand the tax consequences of something that it's your job to make sure they're aware of how this is going to work and what the consequences are. But ultimately, who decides what they do or don't do? They decide what they do, what to do along with their spouse. So they need to make sure that everything is fair. So when they hire an attorney, they're going to tell per the state law and every state is different. This is the recommendation. It's not always 50-50. It needs to be fair. Uh, people always think it's going to be 50-50. In the state of Illinois, it's not. So it's, uh, it depends on the, every situation. So they need to agree with the spouse based on their recommendation and based on everything that they know and they discuss with their team, and they feel comfortable with that. Sometimes things, finding about small things, it's not worth um, all the emotional stress and dragging the process for months and months and months. And they need to have someone who is going to tell them, I know that you're emotionally connected to this, but it's causing you to so much of your stress and 
the cost of it is just not worth it. So having that team together helps out. Having a, a divorce coach when you can provide different perspectives. And because of the emotions and stress, people have better days and worse days. They, they doubt their decisions. They doubt the, uh, themselves in a sense, I don't know anything about it. That's why they need to have a great team who is going to always look in their best interest and provide them with the options. I'm not going to make the decision for anyone, but I'm going to make sure that I'm going to educate them and provide them all the options that are out there so they can reevaluate those and, and, and decide on what's best for them. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And I know I work with a lot of people on making better decisions, right? From starting from the beginning decision of should I stay or should I go all the way through to how do I create a new life, right? And step number one in any decision-making process, and I've studied many of them, is always information. They can't make a decision if they don't know there is one to make. And hence, getting it sounds like getting the information from you is so critical because you're not making the de decision for them. So many people think that they're just going to hand it over to you and say, okay, like you do it. And that's not what you do, but they can't do what they need to do without your help, without your information. And that's what the education and giving different perspectives and different options. And I always feel that the, uh, if you have a good team, everyone can bring something different to the table because everyone has a little bit different uh, experience. Everyone has so different situations. And I can bring my technical skills and my experience, but then we can build on that with someone like you or another attorney or a financial advisor who's so different situations. And that person is so much better off. I know it could be, it could be scary to have that many people involved, but in specific situations when there are complex situations, it's critical to have that. You have to have a support system and that team is going to support you all the way. Yeah. Hundred percent. I'd like to switch gears a little bit now, and you know, I, I happen to know that you are a strong believer in empowering other women, and that you are working on. You're working with the FH Women's Leadership Intensive. Can you tell me a little bit more about what that is and what drives you to be so passionate about empowering women? Um, before I joined Freeman and Huey, I worked um, for 10 years for a big accounting firm downtown Chicago. And, um, and when I was there, it was right after school, um, there were a lot of similar people in the sense they were go-getters. They wanted to make an impact. They wanted to do a lot of things. And I thought I didn't know any better. So when I started to work with Freeman and Huey, I realized that there are just different kinds of people. And there is a... a they needed some support to be confident, to be free to ask for things. Because they work, they were within the smaller firm, they didn't know about all the opportunities that are out there. And they were just not empowered enough to go after their dreams. And I also realized it was such a great learning experience. Everyone is uh, at a different stage of their life. There are some people who maybe need to slow down with their career because they want to spend more time with their kids. Or maybe they have aging parents and they need to pull back because they need to take care of them. And uh, supporting them in any way when it comes to confidence and asking questions and uh, knowing that they have that support and building that network within my firm creates more um, happier people. And when they're happy and they know that they have a backup, they, they have this uh, great loyalty and then they want to stay. And even though sometimes they need to slow down, I know that um, after the bumpy time in their life or maybe when the kids go to college, they will come back and they're going to bring so much value to the firm they're worth investing in. So I created this uh, uh, woman's uh, uh, initiative just to meet from time to time as woman, as a mom, as a career person to talk about different things, time, time management, um, uh, confidence, um, you know, taking care of some, uh, some things. We have a book club that we go through different books, sometimes professional, sometimes just a, a good read, summer read. But I wanted to make sure that there is a space for people to come and share the experience because each of us has a different one and learn from each other, especially now during the 
at post-COVID stage when a lot of people are remote. My firm is 95% remote, so we don't run into each other uh, in the office anymore. So that space creates this, um, um, uh, this, this, this place to get to know each other better from different perspectives, from the personal side of it. And I, I think once you feel like you have that support system, you can bloom to anything you want. Uh, and I just want to make sure that I provide the ground for it. That is so beautiful. And I can see how it ties together, you know, your passion for teamwork, because again, it's not letting the people, even though you may be work, working remotely and not seeing each other, it's trying to bring together women as a team. And there's real power in that, right? Oh, in, absolutely. absolutely. I got so them. much from others, uh, you know, from, from um, uh, dealing with you, like having conversations and discussions and building up the energy. And when you surround yourself with people that are like-minded, that they really believe in you and they want to cheer you up, uh, you really can do a lot of things. And everyone is going through something. It, we don't even know. People are, are sometimes are very open and sometimes they're not. We just want to make sure that we are very graceful about them, about each other. Learning how to be graceful about yourself was, is one of, was one of the topics that we were discussing. Joe, we expect so much from uh, ourselves. Working moms, not working moms, there is so much judgment around us. We want to please everyone and we forget ourselves. So just making sure that we support each other. It's so, so helpful. And then it gives me so much. I'm basically giving back. Uh, I really, I, was, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for so many wonderful women in my life. And I just want others to have the same experience. That That is so wonderful. And it's like, like I often say, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, of those who have gone before us. And we don't, you know, we don't often acknowledge that. And it's beautiful that you are and that you are helping encourage and empower other women and give them confidence. That's a subject we don't talk about um, a lot because you don't want to admit if you don't have it. It's kind of, you know, so a lot of people fake it or they put this stuff on social media that looks great, but inside they're dying. So I, what I hear you saying and doing is that it's about support. It's about putting like-minded people together and about empowering yourself to have that confidence that's authentic, right? This is what you do too. So it's nice that, um, you know, we know each other. And we can uh, you know, build a team when it's needed for our clients uh, yeah. because we share the same values. And you know, that's why I'm here on your podcast, because we do share the same values and we have the same passion. So um, I, I love it. Yes, as do I. Okay, so now I'm going to throw you a total curveball. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> Let's go. In your life, what's the best decision you've made? Personal or professional, doesn't matter. But what do you think is... Or I'll say one of the best decisions you've ever made. Um, even though I don't like it, I like to take a risk because I know that sometimes when you do that and you step out of your comfort zone, um, beautiful things could happen. Um, and everyone can hear my lovely Polish accent. And... Um, you, maybe you cannot tell right now, but I was a very shy person. I hated to talk to people. I was not confident about how I sound. Can they understand me? But a few years ago, I said, I love to talk to people, <laughs> no matter what, if they listen to me, if they don't. But I really want to help out. Uh, I think the urge to, I live American dream. I immigrated here when I was 19, and I'm a partner at the accounting firm. I help people who are super wealthy, who uh, hold uh, governmental positions, or they have a multi-generational wealth, that gave me that confidence to go out and just believe in myself that I can bring something to the table. I, I bring value. And I just wanted to spread that out. So I'm very, I guess the best decision I, I made was not to be afraid of showing who you are and be authentic with my beautiful Polish accent. <laughs> but I know my value and I will be out there sharing what I know and just help other people. That is beautiful. I, I don't even have words to follow that. 
So I think that's a great place for us to call this a wrap. Celia, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, for empowering so many people who I know are listening. Um, where can people find you if they want to do that? Yeah. Um, the best way to find me is on LinkedIn. I know, I know that uh, not a lot of people have those professional sites. Um, you can find me on the Freeman and Huey website. Uh, you have, when you, if you're watching, you have it here um, on my, the name of the firm. Uh, you can go to the website and there is a, my, my profile with my contact information. Uh, and um, that will be the best two ways to find me. Um, I'm on Facebook too, but it's a personal site. Uh, and um, I'm always available to, if, you, if you're not sure if I'm the right person, I'm not right for everyone. You have to have some complexity to use my expertise because if I'm not going to bring any value to you, then it's not worth it to you to, to pay for something that you can get uh, somewhere else much cheaper. But I'm more than happy to reevaluate situations. I do a lot of things for my professional um, uh, colleagues, financial advisors and attorneys when I review the tax return and I uh, provide some feedback about maybe things that I could do better and if it's a good fit or not. So always happy to help, to look at, uh, answer any questions, um, just so you can feel like you're not there alone and then you have someone who wish you well and wants you to succeed. Celia, thank you so much. And for those listening or watching, all of the places are going to be linked in, her sh in the show notes where you can find Sylvia. And for those of you who are listening, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have, then please give us a thumbs up, like, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and I look forward to talking to you again next time.